journey is real, where we talk to real people with real passions who share a real portion of their heart. I'm CJ Peterson. Today, my guest is Lori Maben, and her passion is crab A leukodystrophy. Uh, thank you for coming in today, Lori. Um, I did a little research, and I found out that crab A affects about one in 100,000 individuals. Is that accurate? Um, that is one of the numbers that is out there. They're actually thinking that while crab A is one of 100,000, actual leukodystrophies is more like one in 70,000. So it's not as rare as um, the general public believes it to be. Gotcha. Well, I know you have a personal connection to crab A. Um, would you mind explaining to those who are listening what exactly that is? So my connection with crab A is my first patient after I became a nurse in 2014 had crab A leukodystrophy. Like I said, it's just one of the leukodystrophies that are out there. And she was um, infantile diagnosed, which means at a very young age, um, the home health agency told me they had a nurse on the case, but she'd only been there a few weeks since mom went back to work and dad was looking to go back to work full time too. Essentially, they told me she is on oxygen around the clock and she has a feeding tube and the condition is normally fatal before age two mm -hmm. and um, figure it out yourself because they had never had a leukodystrophy patient before. So that's pretty much oh, what I did. So you were like, uh, oh, okay. yeah, right. <laughs> new nurse, LPN, <laughs> um, licensed practical nurse, not even an RN, and figure it out yourself. So I did the usual Google search at WebMD Mayo Clinic, and I found the Hunter's Hope organization, mm -hmm. which was started by Jim Kelly of the Buffalo Bills football fame mm -hmm. and his wife. They had had a son named Hunter who had the disease and it was fatal and they made it their life's goal to help um, diagnose and treat the conditions. Um, Crebe is not curable, but it is treatable. Mm -hmm. So we're not gonna eradicate it, but we do need to let these children have a head start on treating the condition before it progresses, such as in the case of my patient, Madison Layton. She went through misdiagnosis of malnutrition, failure to thrive, when she started having the breathing difficulties and the very thick, chunky mucus coming up from her lungs. They thought she might have cystic fibrosis. The way leukodystrophies affect the brain, um, they thought possibly cerebral palsy. So they had a, a lot of misdiagnoses they went through before they were finally able to correctly diagnose her. At that point in time, her condition had progressed so far quickly in such a short amount of time that it was no longer treatable. So it was basically manage the symptoms. And how old was she when they actually figured it out? I'm not sure how old she was because I wasn't with her at the time. I do know she was just beginning to pull herself up using you know tables and furniture like most uh, children do. She was just starting to put some words like mama and dada together. Um, by the time I met her, she was nonverbal mm -hmm. and um, she would lay on a couch or propped up on pillows and she had absolutely no movement of her own. So she could lay on the couch and us nurses or even her parents could get up and walk even to another room and you don't have that fear of the baby rolling off the couch because they can't move on their own. Mm -hmm. They also don't cough very well on their own. So you have to have them on a continuous oxygen monitor. She was on continuous oxygen. Some children aren't on it continuously if the disease gets stopped in its track soon enough. And we also had to do um, hand to back, hand to chest. We call it percussion. It's like beating on somebody's back a little bit to loosen up the secretions in her lungs. Mm -hmm. And she ended up going on a percussion therapy vest, which was like strapping on a big skiers vest or a boating safety vest. Mm -hmm. but it was attached to like a pneumatic device and it was very noisy and it would just actually rumble her entire body loosening those secretions, which actually made it easier than to suction her and bring those thick secretions up. So she didn't, you know, 
lose her oxygen supply because of it. And how old was she when that was started? Percussion was started, so I got her in February of 2014. She passed away in June. Um, so I think it started somewhere around April or May, exact time frame. I'm not real sure of. And how old was she? Um, she passed away 19 days before her second birthday. Oh, wow. Perfect. In June. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Well, you and her mother, Chassie Layton, had done something amazing regarding Madison's story. And can you explain to the re to listeners exactly what that is? Yes. So Chassie, after Madison passed, um, petitioned the senators and the re representatives in her county. She lives one county over away from me. And um, finally got somebody to hear her story, Mr. Jim Buki. He came out and after multiple letters and emails and phone calls between himself and his staff and Chassie, they met. Um, we got to tell Madison's story. We got to give a little bit of the background on what leukodystrophies and specifically the Crab A form is. And um, they were also interviewed by a Dayton news station. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happened was, Mr. Buki, he supported in front of the Ohio General Assembly, he petitioned to have them add leukodystrophies, specifically Crab A leukodystrophy, added to newborn screening in Ohio. Before he could get that accepted, he um, had the second week in September in Ohio um, to be recognized as Crab A leukodystrophy awareness week. Oh, nice. And then the bill actually went through, the short name is the Madison Layton Act. Oh. Name for, yeah, right, name for the baby. And Chassie and myself went along with another family who um, lived in Ohio, who had an older child that has Crab A. We all went to the Ohio State House and the two moms got up and talked. Unfortunately, Madison had already passed, so we only had her picture. The other mom actually had her son there in his modified larger stroller with his oxygen and his suctioning and his feeding tube and all the medical supplies they use round the clock on him with them. And then I got to testify as a nurse what it's like to take care of a child with this condition and literally have life and or death in your hands every day. What is that like? Would you mind explaining to those who are listening? It is horrifying. It's very rewarding, but it's very horrifying at the same time, knowing that the child, so leukodystrophies attack the myelin in the white matter in the myelin sheath in the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. So basically your brain, your spinal cord, and it, it affects, like we've already talked about, your breathing, your, um, your moving. So Madison had to be on oxygen all the time. She had to be suctioned frequently, both through her nose and her mouth. She did not have a trach. She did not need that, but she did have a feeding tube implanted in through her stomach. She could not eat. She could not swallow. Once in a while, we would put like a popsicle up against her lips so she could get a little bit of the flavor. She could have just the tiny, tiny little drops of fluid, or they would put a piece of bacon or her favorite thing was red licorice. They'd put it and kind of like rub it around her lips and her mouth so she would get the flavor of it because she loved it, but she couldn't actually swallow it. She couldn't even swallow her own saliva. So it would continuously drool off the side of her mouth, which would mat her curls. We had to keep her beautiful long curly hair and pigtails all the time. Um, and like I've already said, she had to be suctioned a lot. And then all her feeds were through this feeding tube. So she had had several bouts of pneumonia, which is hard to treat in these children because you can't cough up the junk from the lungs with the pneumonia. And she ended up going into Dayton Children's Hospital over Mother's Day weekend in 2014. Yeah, it was really hard. She spent several days there. Hooked up, yeah, and I'm probably going to cry. She spent several days there hooked up to all kinds of monitors and IVs and feeding tubes and just high flow oxygen. We tried to keep her between two and four liters through her cannula in her nose all the time, but there were times we'd have to go up to eight or 10 liters. Wow. And that is not good for sustained use. It really isn't. So they sent her home 
after she'd been there for several days, they essentially sent her home and her home health became hospice care. Her pediatrician met the family and myself at the home and told mom and dad that yes, children's hospital was right, prognosis is not good. She told me expect 24 to 48 hours before Madison passed. Wow. Yeah, happy Mother's Day, right? Um, and this is where it gets hard to talk about her. She lasted about five more weeks. Wow, she didn't, that's amazing. Uh, she didn't pass away until the 22nd of June of the same year. Like I said, 19 days before her second birthday. Crebe being an infantile onset, like I've said, is normally fatal by the second birthday. In her case, it was. We began to hold out hope that when, you know, we got through those first two days, three days, a week, 10 days, two weeks, we began to hold out hope that maybe we were going to have a second birthday celebration and we'd rub a little bit of ice cream, a little bit of frosting on her tongue because she would have her own cake even though she couldn't partake in it. Right. We would smash her hands into it like you do for a one-year-old smash cake. Um, Let her have fun with it. Right. So dad was a volunteer fireman who progressed through assistant chief and chief in the ranks of a fire department lo local to them. And they host four fish fries throughout the warmer, late spring, early fall months. And they liked to have Madison at the fish fries. The whole fire department, they all loved them. A lot of the patrons of the fish fries loved them. Come to find out my parents had been going to the fish fries intermittently for years. So when they found out that I would be going with Madison to take care of her while mom and dad worked the fish fry, they started coming to the fish fries too. So on Friday night, we're at the fish fry and one of my favorite pictures of Madison is of my stepdad holding her. Mm -hmm. And he's wearing a grandpa t-shirt. Um, grandpas are my favorite or I don't remember something about grandpa. And he's holding her and loving on her and you can see her oxygen and you know, all her supplies hooked up and she's just snuggled up against him. And she was doing great Friday. She was great at the fish fry. Saturday, mom texted me because I didn't normally work weekends and said that she'd been a little sick. Um, part of leukodystrophy is they also cannot control their heart rate, their blood pressure and their temperatures. It was not unusual for Madison to drop down to 92 or 93 degrees wow. in her body temperature which normally um, is not safe, but in her case, it was okay. If we kept her above 94 to 95, we were really happy at that. Um, she would also go sky high into the hundreds just at the drop of a hat. So yeah, she was having like, these it's like, right? it's like running in the middle of a carnival. You never know which way to turn because it can go any direction at any point in time. Yes, and she would be laying there perfectly fine, her oxygen, um, we like to keep her over 94% on her oxygen. Didn't really start getting worried um, until she hit like the mid to upper 80s, but she could go from 95, 96 to 42% oxygen, which is almost fatal in itself in a moment's notice. And that's when you really have to be paying attention, jump in, get that suction going, um, sometimes pat her on the chest some. Um, Does she have monitors that are monitoring this? So yeah, she was hooked up to a monitor um, on her big toe uh, every minute of every day, unless she was in the bathtub. And that would give us her temperatures and her pulse ox and her blood pressure. So pulse ox is the level of, the, of oxygen circulating in your blood at any moment's time. Okay. It told us all of that. It was very sophisticated, plus the fact that she was on oxygen all the time, too. So she would just do these huge drops and you wouldn't know why. There were times I would be sitting in the summer where I'd have to turn the air conditioner off in the house, put her in warm pajamas, put a heating pad on my chest on low, lay her on the heating pad and put two of her big thick blankets on top of her and hold her and snuggle her that way just to bring her body temperature up. Now you can imagine in humid Ohio in the middle of the summer, when we're high 80s, 90s, I would be drenched in sweat and barely bringing her up to 96 or 97 degrees, even with all of that going on. Gotcha. So like uh, I said, we heard a little bit just about Maddie herself, because she sounds like she was a cuddler. 
I she had her moments. So um, if she wasn't in a lot of pain, she would cuddle with you. If she liked you, she would cuddle. The family told me the first night that I met them, I had finally held her. I, I wasn't sure about asking to hold her, you know, with this delicate child and all. And mom finally just said, here, I want to hold her and handed her over to me. Um, she cuddled to me right away. She didn't always do that with people, or if she was in a lot of pain, she would just want to be left either lying on the couch or propped up in the corner on her pillows. Mm -hmm. um, she did, she cuddled with my stepdad fine. So going back to that weekend, Sunday, I got this phone call from her mom that she had texted me in the morning, said, Maddie's doing great today, we're gonna go grocery shopping. A couple hours later, I got this phone call I could hardly understand, and all she kept saying was, she's gone, she's gone. Oh no. Just that quick, they had walked into their local Kroger's. Dad and the older daughter had taken off one direction to get some things. Mom was in the produce section and she said Madison made this funny noise. And just as quick as she looked at her and went to grab the suction, which was on the stroller with her, she was gray and turning colors. They were never able to bring her back after that. Just that quick, she was gone. Wow. So I actually, <laughs> Um, I took off and went to their house, which is like 25 minutes away. I got there and her doctor, the family had called her doctor too. Her doctor came in from over an hour away, beat me to the house, and we got there before the squad arrived back with Madison and dad in the squad. And um, one of the fire department members drove mom and the sister. He was in their grocery shopping and saw her trying to deal with it and approach him and said, you know, I'm off duty, I'm a local firefighter, how can I help? He left his groceries right there to drive mom and dad back, or mom and the sister back to the house so dad could ride in the squad. And the doctor ended up pronouncing her there at the house, but by then, it'd been well over an hour, maybe closer to two hours by this point in time that she had been gone, but they never got her back. Wow, that's heartbreaking, sorry. <laughs> So if you guys are taking Madison's story and you're changing it into something that's real and you got this bill passed in her name, in her honor, what can people do to help prevent the situation from potentially happening to them? So like I said, um, leukodystrophies cannot be cured, but they can be treated if they're caught early on. Um, there's over 50 known types of leukodystrophies. They all have infant, child, young adult, old adult um, onsets. The best thing you can do right now, because you will not know unless you just, everybody goes out and finds out if they're a carrier, which is really silly to do. You're not going to do that. The best thing to do is when you have a child a newborn, please ask them to do newborn screening in the hospital. There are, I think, 11 states right now that do it mandatorily. We have several other states, like Pennsylvania is one of them we are working. Um, other leukodystrophy families are working very hard to get the law passed to screen for leukodystrophies. All it takes is a simple um, heel prick of the newborn for a drop of blood. It doesn't tell me. And it's not mandatory across the board, and it can help parents from facing this later? Well, newborn screening is mandatory for th things like PKU, um, which, is, which is phenylketouric okay. something else. Generic it, term it, is. <laughs> PKU is generic, but this done everywhere. There are several things that newborn screening is done everywhere, mm -hmm. but we need to add the leukodystrophies on. Simple heel prick. Um, it's not mandatory in all states for leukodystrophies, though it is for the other newborn screenings. It's a simple test to run. If your state does not test for it, then you can ask, even when you're going for your OB visits at the hospital, um, for your pre-delivery visits, you can ask them if they do this test. If not, if you go to Hunter's Hope organization to that website started by Jim Kelly, there's a place you can order the screening test. It's relatively inexpensive. They have a really basic test that only tests for three or four, and then they have a slightly more expensive test, less than $100, that will test for more of them. 
It does not tell you which leukodystrophy you have, but it does lead your doctors, your pediatricians then into doing the additional blood tests and the MRIs that diagnoses the changes in the brain. If you catch it early enough, you can have blood donor, um, cord blood, or stem cell transplants. What that does is it doesn't cure you of leukodystrophy, but it stops the disease in its tracks. It will never get any worse than where it is at right at that point in time. In Madison's case, unfortunately, by the time they found out that's what she had, she didn't qualify for those treatments. Gotcha. So you mentioned Hunter Soap a couple of times. What's the website for it? It is www.huntershope.org. So I was listening. Would you mind spelling that out? H U N T E R S H O P E dot org. And that is honestly the easiest website I found for not just a new provider or a new nurse learning to deal with these conditions, but also families. They have tons of resources out there and they also have a wall of honor and that's all the children whose families have reported to Hunter, Hunter's Hope. It has a little bit of information about them and their birth and death dates and their pictures too. Oh wow. Um, well, I do thank you so much for sharing your heart because that was hard. <laughs> um, is there, we have a few minutes left. Is there anything else you would like to add? Um, I'd like to thank you for letting me talk about my passion today. I'd like to thank Mike and Chassie Layton, Madison's parents, and for anyone who understands HIPAA. I have not violated any HIPAA um, acts talking about her. I do have permission implicitly from the family to talk about her and use her name. Um, and every time before I do talk about them, I always ask mom again, is it still okay? And I always get a resounding yes. And the big thing is, is please, please, please have your baby's newborn screen while they're still in the hospital or have your midwife get that kit from Hunter's Hope and have her do that test right there at home. If you have a home delivery, take it to the hospital lab. Please get your babies checked for leukodystrophies. There's no need for children to suffer like Madison and so many others have. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Again, that website is www h u n t e r s h o p e dot o r g and there's a lot of resources on there i was on it before i got on with lori so there's a lot of things you can go through there and a lot of different resources that can help you in regards to this and as she said there is a test on there that you can get um test your babies so thank you lori so much um the information was very helpful um, hopefully to those out there. Those who do not have this testing in your state, please get a hold of the people, the senators. Is that who they need to get a hold of? Who, please? Who do they need to get a hold of? The senators or who? Senators, your representatives. Um, oftentimes you can even look on Facebook if you have Facebook or just Google search newborn screening in your own state and see what they test for. If they don't test for leukodystrophies, I can guarantee you there is a mom or dad or a group of them out there in every single state in the nation that is petitioning, actively talking to people and petitioning to try to get newborn screening to add leukodystrophies to their list of mandatory tests. I mean, I would think that it would be a no-brainer on that one. So you, you would think, much. and parents, in the states that do have the testing already, if they really don't want to take that chance and have their insurance bill that extra $25 or $15, $50, they can opt out of that. But I really, really highly recommend newborn screening. Matter of fact, the state of Ohio has a, a young girl who was the first, I won't use her name, I know her mom is on Facebook and talks out about it, but I've not spoken to the mom to see if I can use her name, but she was the first baby diagnosed in the state of Ohio with leukodystrophy due to mandatory leukodystrophy newborn screening. Awesome. And that's, you know, and you guys have given Madison a license, <clears throat> you know, and I think that that's great. And I applaud you guys for that. Um, I do, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your story. Um, Chazzy, if you're listening, thank you so much for giving permission 
Um, and thank you guys for listening to The Journey is Real, where we talk to real people about their real passions, and they share a real portion of their heart today, like Lori did. I'm CJ Peterson with cjpetersonwrites.com. Until next time. <laughs>